You mentioned building. Um, have you noticed, certainly 20 years ago, the tradition were, was for um, Gurkhas to serve abroad and bring their pensions back and then retire up into the hill villages. Um, have you noticed this changing in the last 20 years? Oh yes, there's been a great drawdown to the towns in the valley, valleys. Kathmandu is an attraction, poker is an attraction, <coughs> and of course to the Terai towns and uh, the rice bowl of Nepal. And this is obvious. We give the workers a taste of running water and electricity. And we teach them to accept these and think big. And it's not in the nature of us humans to think small unless we really have to. The British Army is not in the business of teaching them how to think small. And the majority of serving soldiers now realize that their parents pulled back in the rat race advancement because they were not versed, they didn't have a particularly good education, certainly their grandparents, and therefore the key to success these days is to get education. It's unfortunate though, as I see it, uh, that the water of the wells of Nepalese education has been very badly poisoned by the influence from Bihar and West Bengal. In what way? The way uh, that there was a lot of social disorder in 46 and 47 in Calcutta, and the thought that the only way that uh, the British had managed to stay on in India was disadvantageous. No advantages were seen at all of the bureaucracy roads, railways, and business of liquid. They weren't looked at at all. And it is unfortunate that Calcutta and Bihar or Issa have had <coughs> a lot of uh, this anti-West communism type feeling. And the place where the Nepalese contact, uh, communists would run away, Patna, has, has as a university reputation for redness and student unrest, etc., probably over and above those in many other places. And when the university, the Tibuan University, was set up in 56, 57, it's about 30, how long ago is it now, 25, 26, 27 years, uh, the 16 professors who started as founder members of the university here were all from Patna. And in Pokhara, until recently, we had um, <coughs> the, the Who was from Patna. Yes. And Budiman has said that he, if he wasn't friends with the English, excuse me, who a Scot, that he would have accepted that all Englishmen were Bible and sword type people, and he wouldn't have been friendly with, with the English at all. And it's most sad to me and surprising that the cult hero on the Pokhara, one of the Pokhara campuses, the Pinarayan campus, is Subhas Chandra Bose, who, by our idiom, was the biggest traitor of all the Indian National Army, and the GIFs, the Japanese inspired forces, inspired forces of World War II. And one of the major, let me get this right, either Delhi, Bombay, or Calcutta, is going to have its uh, aerodrome, its airport name changed to Subhas Chandra Bose. And it's extraordinary to think uh, that. After all that has happened in the subcontinent, Nepal was never under the bridge, it's always been an independent country, and that there should be such a negative amount of thinking to have found its way into the textbooks uh, that, have, that has resulted, along with those who've done their teacher training in India and those from India who have come to help the teacher training in Nepal I should have resulted uh, in the time walk we had in Nepal on the present day, the 16th of April 1991, uh, that everybody or a whole lot of people think that uh, 
more Marxist Leninism uh, is the answer to all our problems. Why is that? And if the students hadn't been brought up with this emotive issue in the forefront of their thoughts, uh, then we wouldn't have had this particularly strange situation that we have now. And I put that down to the education that has spread from northern India up into this country. That, again, resulting from the anti-British sentiment that was whipped up by unscrupulous politicians to a tremendous extent. From, uh, ooh, it was particularly the manifest, 1946-47. And if you read Francis Tuker's While Memory Serves, a most uh, dispassionate account of how the politicians were willfully wrong in everything they said, or most things that they said. I've come across this also, I'm afraid this is a bit of a tangent, but when I was in North Vietnam, it was Vietnam, then in Hanoi, the first British soldier to get there in 21 and a half years, and this would be very late 1975, I saw the Chinese attaché, and he said, whatever we say, out loud through the media, we actually want the Americans to stay in uh, Thailand because we don't want the Russians there. But of course we can't say that out loud. And this double standard that seems to stem, not necessarily from all politicians, but certainly from all Brahmins, is responsible for the sad, to me, sadly low standard of pure ethical knowledge that you, as a professor, will know that <laughs> maybe such a thing doesn't exist. Have you um, any views, you're talking, talking from the top at the university level, at the level of the middle schools and up to the 10th class and so on, if one walks around Pokhara, one, is, one of the most striking features is the vast multitudes of blue and blue uniformed girls and boys walking up and down the streets going to school. Um, do you think... Have you any views on the educational system at that level in Pokhara? Yes, I have. <clears throat> One of my jobs some years ago was to visit 40 high schools, which in parenthesis are not high schools because in uh, Nepali they are middle schools, to see where we, <clears throat> with Canadian funding and British government funding and private funding, welfare funding, could help. And I've had quite a, a lot of experience with these schools. I'm a member of a school board, in, both in Pokhara and in Kathmandu. And one difficulty in the spread of education, which linked with what I said earlier on, the parents didn't have it and therefore their children must. Education is looked at as an open sesame to future enhancement, but the quality of teaching and the old-fashioned syllabi from which the curricula are produced and the poverty of the school buildings as spoke to that paucity have all produced a system that doesn't answer the problems that need to be answered and it would be in about it's five years from the middle 70s, early, early 70s, when the Nepalese educational system was completely revamped. The educational minister was uh, a Muslim, a Nepali Muslim, and as soon as he revamped the system, he sent his children overseas to be educated. And the best of American, British, and Filipino education was taken. And a certain amount of extracurricular work was introduced to try and keep people back in the villages and not to go to the towns of a paved in gold. Uh, again, there's so little imagination uh, in the, these extramural activities. Up in parts of the very high places where there are schools, one or two, I found instead of having animal husbandry or a certain amount of horticulture or tree culture, 
the boys were taught how to keep the bookkeeping and the girls how to typewrite. Well, they weren't typewriters and there were no books to be kept. And over the years, there has been controversy about whether the medium should be English or Nepali, and English is wanted, and this has resulted in a whole lot of private schools being set up. English is taught, so they're called international, and the code word for private school is boarding, although very often people don't board them. Budimas was, uh, he went to a government school, five and a half years after he, his father had died, he stopped going to a school in the village. And he was in a class of 80, because no one could be stopped, there's no control, and how can you teach people in a class of 80? Now, the authorities have realized that the present system is wrong. It's built around the Indian method of having sixth form as an intermediate degree range. And a lot of the hotheads are to be found uh, in campuses where they're not well known. Uh, they're not known as well, obviously, as they are in their villages. And they say we're like candles until we get to class 10, where stiff and unlit and then we become lit and we become alive in the campus and then uh, when we leave the campus and become married <coughs> we are nothing but a burnt out candle and uh, of course the candle's lost its shape by then. However, now people are trying to get away from the intermediate level of education in on the campus and they're starting scheme called 10 plus 2, in other words, to make certain selective schools into places where up to sixth form education is taught. Uh, the new government, whenever it comes in, will have as one of its is the revamping of the educational system that has been seen as a failure by the Nepalese themselves. I put out an idea that the middle, middle school, what we now call high school, should merely have up to class 8. And there should be centers of class 9 and 10 up to school certificate level. That is not far off your O level. And then in that same school, that same center, 9 and 10 to take up to their A levels. And then go to the campus if the BA or MA is the target of the student. Now that has found favor in certain local places. I mean, I haven't been able to cast my to talk to the ministry, but thank you. But the reason that you are finding so many schools is not only commercial, but the increase in population and the never finishing requirement for education is at the back of it. Also, a lot of the girls are studying because they'd far rather these days be educated and have the possibility of a job, even though it means no marriage or a later marriage, uh, than to marry young with a person possibly not to the girl's choice. One of the uh, main difficulties is education. Another is medicine and health care. Nepal has probably one of the lowest ratios of doctors to patients in the world and one of the lowest expenditures on medical care in the world. Um, have you noticed any changes and have you any comments on that field? Well, we've got health posts that have proliferated over the last decade, but uh, many of the people have no faith in the medicines. <clears throat> they say it comes from made in India and they think that the medicines that come are of a low quality. Uh, if they can get foreign medicines, Thai medicines, Chinese medicines, British medicines, American medicines, that would be the choice rather than the local medicines. Uh, so much trouble comes from the people who work in those health centers, <coughs> giving them what few medicines come through to their families or to the bosses or around the place, uh, rather than to those who would need it either the poor people at the bottom of the pile who would stay unhealthy at the bottom of the pile. Recently, in the last seven and a half, eight years, 
one of them there'll be two new campuses produced or should I say one new university and one new campus and the new campus has been on Ayurvedic medicine and the new university has been a Sanskrit university not quite answering your question but I was asked by a high Nepalese official what I thought about a new Sanskrit university all found being instituted and I said that's a step forward into the past likewise the Ayurvedic medicine fine as long as you've got a certain amount of raw material to work from but in this day and age maybe penicillin is easier to come by and more efficacious than many other drugs no I'm saddened by the amount <clears throat> the paucity of the medical facilities and I'm even more saddened uh, by the uncaring attitude of those who administer these medicines. Now you've got the hospital road to the Poker Hospital. Where do they throw away their old bandages, their blood-stained bandages and swabs? Outside, on the ground. And the cows and the crows come and look at it. And we walk through it. And one of the lads who came to see me got very ill. And I and another man took him to hospital. And uh, I was busy, and the fellow who helped me wasn't too happy himself, health-wise, and he had a job to do. And the sister said to me, which one of you going to stay with him? This ill man. I said, you're the one wearing the white sari, not I. I don't wear it. Nor does this fellow. And uh, what happened? We left, and the lad was left entirely alone until my friend went back a couple of days later. He tried to go and spend a penny. During that time, he'd fallen onto the floor in a faint. He was there for a couple of hours until someone put another bed, took pity on him, put him back. Eventually, we got him out of hospital, and I personally took him to the house with him under the village with his family. And I washed him down, and there he was. He hadn't had a wash in uh, four days. He had a temperature of 105 or something. I think we thought he had to die. Well, if you've got that, the mindset that people aren't worth saving because of whatever reason, the Brahmanism, the Brahmanical influence in this country gives you first, second, third, and fourth, eleven citizens. It doesn't matter how, many, how much medicine you put into the medical centers in the villages, you're not going to get any appreciable end result. You've um, noticed this influence in, in education and in religion and in um, medicine. What about in administration and bureaucracy? The way that the offices are overstaffed, the inability to take any decision except at minor level, the fear that the decision taken will not please the person above, the blistering inefficiency, the fact that office work happens in time that the Hindu calendar doesn't see as auspicious means that time is a Western impediment that really is a bit of a bore. Has meant, and the overstaffing, etc., etc., et has meant uh, that the administration grinds inefficiently and so slowly that uh, it wastes many too many human resources and much too much time. For instance, we go to the office, we've got something to do, we've got to go back farming. Who are you? I'm a guru. Come tomorrow. Come tomorrow. Come tomorrow. Three or four days. Up to a fortnight. And you don't pay a little bit to the pew. When your bit of paper eventually gets to the top, then someone comes along and pays some money and that your thing goes to the bottom. And you either got to pay a little something to for the pew and actually to put the bit of paper in front of master's eyes, or you lose out in the mountains because you the season for farming, whatever phase of farming there is, will soon be over. And uh, even though when the king himself last year said a hundred functionaries will go into the country and make the proof of positive, the proof of citizenship papers for those who haven't been able to get them, uh, it didn't matter 
very often whether the four people who said their names were whatever, whatever. Uh, the functionary put the wrong name. <laughs> and the man or the woman would remonstrate and say, that's not my name. It's bad luck. There it is. We can't change it. Well, that's not to get them the top of the box decision, the first level of efficiency. Which is... Um Registration for citizenship relates obviously to the political situation. Um, Nepal seems from the outside for many people a strange relict of a feudal world which remained more or less intact until very recently. Now the great cry is for democracy. Um, have you any views on the, the difficulties of making a rapid switch from a system which, in which a small group controlled the whole political system to one where there was party politics. Immense, immense difficulties. There's no tradition of making a mind up politically. Now we in Britain have our difficulties. Now we've been playing at this for so long. India has had party politics for 46 years and human sacrifices, or however many years, human sacrifices must be paid with monotonous regularity. Uh, here, the whole concept of a free vote is foreign. You've seen that the various flags outside the houses denoting what the head of the house thinks. And it's looked at askance if a son doesn't think the same politically as the father does. No, uh, the multi-party system had to come. It came too late, and it didn't come before it did, because when it was tried before, people didn't take it in the spirit that would generate efficiency. It was looked at more as getting into a position for enrichment and advantages, i.e. the personal good, then the country's good. Now Nepal is not the only place where that happens. Senate committees in America will point out where many people have not had uh, anyone's interest at heart except maybe the local sexual interests in the person himself or herself. But you've got to start somewhere. It takes time. And a lot of time has got to elapse, will elapse, before the Nepalese understand politics. I mean, for instance, how many generations of having traffic in a country will inculcate into a child so that he or she doesn't run across the road or regard the road as his or her own. And a lot of what we're seeing result from results from the negative aspect of an absolute monarchy, where only personal fawning and toadying got a person at the top. And uh, what you and I might call a bribe is part and parcel. Because part and parcel of life, you see, in the Brahminical structure, the Brahmin has four perks, inalienable rights, and one is money. And uh, that means that 10% or 1% cut of the budget is the, the Brahmin's right. And uh, if somebody else gives the fellow some money, that's his right. And if the civil law says no, it doesn't matter, because it is his religious right. And the, another of his basic four rights is salvation. You get excused, no matter what he does when he's finished, you get excused. So uh, as long as you've got the dead weight of Brahminism and the thought, that the elite are privileged to have position and wealth, then the whole concept of a multi-party democracy where each man and woman's vote gives him an intrinsic, gives him and her an intrinsic level rather than an instrumental level uh, of sameness, then it's, it's bound to take time before what you and I know as a multi-party democracy, one person, one vote, etc., can reach the standard of where we're used to it, i.e. in Britain. And I think that although the multi-party system this time could, that came in later than it might have done, 
and much of the unhappiness that led up to the introduction could have been avoided and had wiser counsels been listened to at the top. The fact is that it is here now. Uh, the Constitution allows it, uh, the police and the army are taking a back seat where hitherto they would not have done. And how long does it take to get out of a feudal system, especially from an absolute monarchy, to parliamentary democracy, where not only are we bound by the Hindu holy book Manu Smriti, which lays down the laws of how the caste system works, which the king's court is, uh, on which the king's court is based even today. Uh, with the strange religious, sorry, the strange educational ideas that have seeped through from a part of India <coughs> where the love-hate relationship and the two standards, the double tongue, plays us a large part. You've got a, you're starting two or three paces behind everywhere else, 20, 30 paces behind everywhere else, and you've got to get over these last fruitless three decades, these last fruitless three decades. And if you were to ask me this question in 30 years' time, God willing, we're both alive, I could say, now we're back to where we could have started had we not had a part of this system over the last 30 years. One, you talked about... Um bribery and corruption. Another very noticeable element in many third world countries is personal connection, patronage. I think the um, Nepali phrase is afno manche. Um, I may be wrong. Is that an important part of the political and administrative system? It's an important part of everything. I was saying to Buddhim Khan this morning that uh, I would not be in the position that I am if I hadn't known the people who I do. And uh, it doesn't matter who will take over the government of this country afterwards, the Nepalese are Nepalese are Nepalese. And uh, you may have read letters to an English gentlewoman. Uh, I don't know the From an Indian, Indian judge. In a judge, yes. Well, that will say that to work against the family is the worst thing that any Indian can do, and we are part of the Indian subcontinent as far as that's concerned. And um, that book also says that a change needs three generations or something traumatic. Well, we've had the trauma, uh, but it takes a, a long time mentally to catch up. Such a barren period. Patronage, patronage, who you know, I believe means more than anything else in this country, except at times when money is concerned. And I've never been asked for a bribe because they know that an English person is not in the habit of giving bribes. I know possibly that even had I tried to offer them, I don't know quite how I'd tried, but even if I had tried, I would never have been um, sure that the way I was doing it was the way that it was accepted. And even if it were accepted, once it was known that uh, I was a bribe taker, my life here would have been very hard. Uh, as far as that side of life is concerned, I know a lot of people, probably fewer in positions of authority than those not in positions of authority, Every single bus that I've ever been on that is not 100% tourist has always had at least one person who has known me. And I'm talking now from 1982, it's nine years. The man and I travel quite a lot. No, to know a person is uh, most important. There are several things, three or four things that are difficult in this country. First is to buy land cleanly, that is without any lawsuit hanging on to any purchase. The second thing is to marry someone with who you can live the rest of your life with. Third is known as the right connection. The person who stands at the door is how they will 
connection to Holy Spirit, the right connection. And the fourth, that neither God nor the King can do, is to make a person understand what is needed once that person's feelings have been hurt. Very nice. John, um, finally, finally on the autobiographical note, you, have, you started off saying that you were not good at languages, but you have mastered how many Asian languages? Nine. Nine, and many of them very difficult indeed. Um, you have also written a number of books. You have had a very distinguished military career. Um, you've recruited many hundreds, if not thousands, of Gurkha troops. 2,149. <laughs> um, and you have achieved the miracle of being absorbed into a um, Gurung family, uh, of which the representatives are now on film. Um, if you had to single out one uh, or two things for which you would like to be best remembered in the future, when this film is shown in a thousand years' time, what would you say? I think the proudest, in the nicest sense of the word, thing that's ever happened to me, and the most proud-making thing that's ever happened to me, is the total acceptance at the highest level in this country as being worthy to be taken as a citizen amongst some of the world's nicest people. And to me that's almost miraculous because the status I have has never happened before in the history of the country. And I think the second one, I may forget this when I've said it, is that I am unconventional enough to be eccentric enough to be regarded as different from everyone else or most other people, and that has, in Asia certainly, not only in Nepal, is taken as having an inner strength that many others haven't. I'm not saying that uh, I'm full of inner strength, I'm probably a bigger card than the next person, uh, but there's something there, where it came from, I cannot say, uh, that has given me, a mere smear nobody, almost a charmed life of miraculous proportions. And I'm ever grateful for this. Colonel John Cross, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure.